know, it's, I think what we'd like to try to do in this panel is begin to understand how much money is actually coming towards the New York, New Jersey region and um, what it can be used for. And I, my assumption going into this conversation is that there's probably not a perfect connect between the supply of money and how it's been designated by Congress and the demand for that money and what may be needed in the short term and probably especially in the long term. So I, I hope that we'll you know begin to get some handle on you know one what it can be used for uh, as specifically as we can possibly understand that in the brief amount of time that we have here today, but also begin to try to figure out what it can't be used for and what those kind of future needs may be uh, in terms of dollars. So um, as you all know, uh, Congress, with some reluctance and with the screaming and yelling of our governors did appropriate this unbelievably large sounding amount of money of $60 billion, uh, called this the San in the Sandy Supplemental. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a phenomenal amount of money and it's gonna do some good. And I guess the, the challenge we have as advocates in this room in, and policy makers and experts and so on is to try to figure out how to make the best use of that money as we go forward. So, um, uh, MWA has put together a terrific panel for us today, um, and I, just to sort of lay out how it's going to kind of work, uh, we're going to ask uh, Jamie Rubin to kick off. Um, Jamie, as you may know, is kind of the New York director of the Hurricane Sandy Relief Task Force, and a uh, huge, huge job. Um, he's got lots of kudos for the work that he's been doing on this. Uh, obviously really tough, tough position. So we're going to let him sort of scope this out, give us a sense of what they've been doing, how they're thinking about it, where the money may go. Uh, we're going to um, uh, move from Jamie to uh, Anthony Ciora, who's with the um, Army Corps, and understand what the money that's been allocated to them is for. And there's more than $5 billion that they've got their um, control of in order to be able to do good things here. So we'll try to figure out more specifically what that's about. Um, we've got uh, Giles Parker from the uh, Parks Department, uh, from the Interior Parks Department, uh, to talk about what they're going to be able to do with money, how much money they have and how much, um, you know, how much discretion they have, et cetera. And then um, we're going to ask David Miller and then Jim Tripp both uh, to talk about, you know, what's happened in other places in similar situations like the Great Lakes and in the Gulf um, where big chunks of money have been available to be spent and how that money has been used and what lessons there are for us in this region for how we can use the money best here. Um, and I guess, you know, given those two guys and their kind of civic-based histories, you know, we're going to ask them a little bit to sort of help us think about what we can do to make sure that, you know, civic voices can have more purchase on trying to figure out how to influence the use of money in this region. So, um, we've asked folks to make brief, you know, five, seven minute introductory comments. We're going to kind of race through those, uh, although listen carefully and we'll try to get as much out as we can, and then we're really going to open it up to you. So start thinking about the questions you want to ask, and I know there's some cards that are going to circulate, and you know start passing them up as soon as you start to get them, so I can sort of see what we've got, and you know how much, uh, you know how to order them up. So, but we really want at least half, if not the majority, of the session to be dedicated to you, so you can ask the questions uh, that you've got about this. So, Jamie, over to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And so I actually wrote out remarks, and what I'm going to do, although I'm perfectly capable of doing things ad lib. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I am going to try to stick to my script for the most part and what I try to do in this is just give a sense of what the task force is. Um, it's kind of a new player on this scene um, and the most consistent question um, about what the federal government is doing that I've heard is what exactly is the task force and how it's different from all these other um, people that are playing in this process. So I'll try to give a little bit of an answer about that. Um, I will talk about um, some of the money that's available and what the kind of guidelines are around it. I should say I'm not, um, I'm definitely not here to talk about the money that's been allocated to other of our federal agencies. So, um, you know, the core and, and, and the Federal Park Service and everybody else, they can very much speak for themselves. Um, I can talk about how we're working with them to give you a little bit of a sense of what our, we think our role is. 
um, I'm closer up to the, um, the community development block grant money, which is the money, the $16 billion that was allocated directly to HUD. Um, I am sort of a HUD employee, so I guess I'm part of that process. Um, and my boss, Sean Donovan, is absolutely a HUD employee, and so um, he's directly responsible for that um, for that money, and that's the piece that I've got the most uh, kind of the deepest knowledge of. But again, I'm not a uh, I'm not a uh, community development block grant expert, so I can give you my kind of uncensored views about that piece of it, and then. Um, I will just say up front that I'm probably going to get most of it wrong, um, and so I definitely am not speaking for the policy guys back at HUD. So um, I apologize in advance for any misinformation that I can pull out today that's later contradicted by the fact. Um, and I know there's no press here, so it won't be an issue. There's actually a press here. Yep. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is all off the record. Um, so I'm Jamie Rubin, I'm the New York State Director uh, for the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force. Thanks for inviting me. Um, a bit of background, um, as you might know, President Obama signed an executive order in December, um, uh, about a month after the, the hurricane hit, creating the task force and uh, tasking it with the goal of, quote, ensuring that the federal government continues to provide appropriate resources to support affected state, local, and tribal communities to improve the region's resilience, health, and prosperity by building for the future. And what the task force is essentially the heads or their designees of most of the cabinet agencies with the exception of state uh, and a couple of others, um, and several members from the other executive offices, including I think five or six folks in the White House, um, certainly the head of, uh, Joanne Larson, the head of the Army Corps is on it, and, and many others. Um, the chairman is a uh, native New Yorker and uh, my old friend, um, HUD Secretary Sean Donovan, um, who was appointed by the, by the president to chair it, both because he is a native, because HUD is traditionally at the center of a lot of disaster relief, particularly in recovery efforts, um, and, and because Sean is, as I said, Sean is a native and he's got a long time interest in this and his issues. So what are our goals? Um, well, they're all aimed at rebuilding the region back, not only stronger, but also smarter. So um, to do that, we work with um, all of our federal partners, the, obviously FEMA, Department of Transportation, the Corps, National Park Service, um, others that you probably less uh, less clearly think of in terms of disaster recovery and response, HHS certainly, EPA obviously very prominently, and many others that I'm, I'm not naming, um, to, to ensure that, or try to ensure that the federal response is coordinated, and as you know, um, particularly the after a disaster of this magnitude, um, there can be some confusion about roles and responsibilities, and we're trying, one of our jobs, my job, and part of the reason that it is so hard in some ways is to um, try and iron out some of the, um, iron out the frictions and, um, and intercede where there are, um, where there's any kind of tension, either between federal agencies or between the locals and the feds. Um, we, there is something in place called the National Disaster Recovery Framework, NDRF, which the Obama administration created in 2011 to codify lessons learned from past disasters, particularly from the long and expensive process of helping the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina. We've heard a number of um, Katrina veterans talk about their experiences today. What you're seeing in this region now is, I think, the first um, uh, run of a, a really new approach to recovery by the federal government. You know, this NDRF, in, in, together with the task force that I represent, um, is the, uh, the sort of physical manifestation of that. We work with all the agencies across the federal government to ensure that the $50 billion that Congress appropriated in the South Sandy SUP are used wisely. We're constantly in touch with the agencies, state and local governments, community leaders, and others to ensure that everyone has a voice. Um, the other, we've got several other sort of official tasks besides coordination. We have a report that's due you know, on August 2nd to the President that will lay out best practices and a number of new policies for disaster recovery. Uh, and Sean's hope is that this will change the way the report itself will change the way that uh, that we think about disasters and response to them. It's not as um, daunting a task as the $20 million report that the Corps has uh, on its plate. Uh, it's more limited in scope, and um, and we don't have the same amount of money to spend on this preparation, unfortunately. So then the question, of course, is that's a segue into what about that money? What about the $50 million? Um, the basics are that it was appropriated across about 20 agencies. Uh, including $2 billion for um, FTA, uh, Federal Transit Authority, uh, Administration Emergency Funding to Public Transit Authorities through the DOT, $5.9 billion for the National Flood Insurance Program, $1.9 billion um, uh, as, part of, as part of the Army Corps' uh, uh, overall uh, appropriation, 
and HUD itself got $15.2 billion to HUD for, to itself for, uh, for CDBG, and that's, I think, net of sequestration dollars. So the original number was more like 16 point something, divided between three areas, New York City, uh, New York State, X New York City, uh, and New Jersey, and, and they're basically a third, a third, a third, and it was, there's a, as I'm sure you all know, there's a, a formula uh, that, that uh, fairly scientifically uh, divides up how the money is allocated. The first tranche, which um, the first of probably three tranches of the, of the CDBG money to be handed out has already been allocated. Um, uh, and again, I'm sure everybody in this room is aware of the city, New York City, New York, and New Jersey each got about $1.8 billion. Uh, bless you. And the state of New York got, that's another part of my job, I'm just to stay sort of conscious of everybody's health. Uh, um, uh, uh, New York, uh, the state of New York, X again, New York City really, um, gets about $1.7 billion. Um, and obviously the rest of the, the community developed block grant money is going to be doled out in later tranches, which the timing is uncertain, but certainly will be as quick as, um, and to your point about supply and demand, will be time to meet the demand for the money. Um, one point that is important to note, and I'm not sure that everybody realized this at the time, but the, the, um, the community development block grant appropriation was specifically allocated not only for Sandy, but also for all disasters that took place in 11, 12, and in 13, just to make the obvious point. We don't know what disasters will have taken place in all 2013 since 2013 is only a third of the way through. So um, while we all hope that Sandy is by far the largest of those, um, there's certainly, uh, we have to sort of keep a reserve, uh, not, and there's certainly no assurance that there'll be any later similar appropriations for any future disasters since this one um, uh, was such a challenge to get. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, what can the CDBG money in particular be used for? Well, um, as you, I'm sure you know, uh, the great thing about CDBG grants is the flexibility. Um, we, the way they work essentially is we choose grantees, in this case, the two states and the city, um, and ask them to develop action plans. Um, and then uh, while HUD has significant influence over how those action plans are designed and then uh, what they look like once they're approved, in essence, they are the state and city, the grantees' plans. Um, and our primary commitment is that we work with them to get them, um, you know, make sure that they're uh, compliant with the law and all of our guidelines and our notices. But in the end, they are the plans that, that, uh, that the local governments, uh, that they reflect the local government's priorities. Um, and Sean's commitment is to approve them as quickly as possible, so this is what we're doing. Um, finally, I guess I should just say that the priorities as reflected in those plans, uh, which have all been put out for public comment, and uh, in the case of the states of New Jersey and New York, have both been submitted formally to HUD at this point, reflect a number of their key priorities, primarily, of course, housing, economic development, but also, in some cases, infrastructure and capacity building. Um, and we expect that some of those um, uh, will tail off as later tranches come through because some of the needs will be met and other priorities will move to the fore, particularly infrastructure and some other things. Um, I should say, um, while the report is going to be out on August 2nd, and we hope that our, our work over the long term will be viewed as being successful, um, just to brag on my boss for a second, we've already achieved a couple of interesting things. Last week, Sean announced uh, here in New York, uh, actually in New Jersey, I should say, um, uh, the adoption of a new national flood standard by the federal government. So now people using federal funds to rebuild uh, will be required to build to one foot above the elevation recommended by the most recent available federal flood guidance. Structures will need to be elevated or if elevation is not possible. Then essential systems, spoilers, electrical panels, etc., will need to be moved to higher ground or other mitigations will need, uh, mitigation efforts will need to be enacted. Now on the one hand, um, in the case of New Jersey and New York City, um, and, and, and really the rest, and Long Island, um, these reflected uh, standards that had already been, in some cases, adopted and this sort of uh, in the case of New Jersey, for example, um, simply um, uh, helped concretize those standards. I think they do, did a couple things. First of all, this is a, this is now a, an official federal standard across all the agencies, so it's there. It's not just for this region; it's for all regions. Obviously, that's important. I think the second thing is, and and much less noticed at the time, is that this was the first. And I don't can't tell you this for the absolute truth, but I'm told it's true. This is really the first time that the federal government has taken into account in this way the impact of climate change. Um, and as we all know, um, many people in this room have been fighting this battle for a long time. That's a significant um, step forward, I think. So it was a proud thing for Sean to be able to do. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I've got plenty more to say, but everybody has got questions. So um, thanks for letting me speak. Thanks, Jamie. So Jamie, did I count right that there's $25 billion headed to kind of the, the three entities in that pile of money you just described? The three entities? New York City, New York State, New Jersey. Uh, no, well, the, the overall is, I'm sorry, 
had the overall the overall appropriation was fifty. <coughs> the overall appropriation was fifty fifty one really because nine billion extra nine billion topped up the flood insurance. Uh, so the community development block grant piece, which is the HUD, the flexible money, is sixteen billion. Again, net of some frustration is more like fifteen billion. Um, and then the other agencies got cascaded down from that. So DOT, for example, at ten, I think Core Four got. I can't remember what the core got out of this, a lot, 5 point three something like this, uh, and, and so on, FEMA got it in the mountains, something like that, so. All right, well, last question is, when does the task force sunset? Um, excellent question. Um, August 2nd is when our report is due, and then we've got another 60 days of sort of cushion after that to, you know, complete work, wrap up. I, you know, I think there was built in the notion that if we have a lot more to do, then, uh, you know, we could get an extension, but the idea was not to create a new federal bureaucracy, there seems to be the general view that there's enough of that. Uh, uh, so I would say, you know, between August and October is what we're thinking about. Okay, all right, thanks so much. So Anthony, you want to uh, tell us what the core is doing, what the money's going to be used for, what it can't be used for? Sure. Okay, good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank the MWA for inviting me to participate in this uh, panel this afternoon. Uh, as was previously mentioned, the Corps of Engineers Civil Works component of the $60 billion Sandy Supplemental Legislation is $5.3 billion. And uh, that's predominantly for work within the North Atlantic Division of the Corps of Engineers. Some of it uh, is eligible to be used by projects outside the North Atlantic Division. Which, for those of you who aren't familiar with how the Corps, Corps is geographically structured, the North Atlantic Division extends from Maine down to Virginia. And of that uh, 5.35 billion within the North Atlantic Division, as you can imagine, uh, most of the funds are available for projects or will be available for projects within New York and New Jersey since that area suffered the brunt of the impacts uh, of, of Sandy uh, last fall. Um, I'm gonna walk through first uh, some of the uh, different appropriations or colors of money that are included in the legislation, and then I'll walk through quickly uh, the different phases of projects uh, that will utilize, utilize those funds. Um, first off, I mentioned $5.3 billion, just to put it in perspective, order of magnitude. Uh, that exceeds the annual core Civil Works budget um, over recent years, so our, our budget's been coming in under $5 billion, so you know, you're talking at least uh, half a billion dollars more uh, than the Corps usually receives nationally. Uh, I'm gonna focus my briefing today, of course, of course, on New York and New Jersey, because I understand that's with the audience, but I apologize, I, over the last week or so, I've given briefings uh, for the NAD numbers, for the New York State numbers alone, the New, York, New Jersey numbers alone, and then the New York District numbers alone. So um, I'll do my best to uh, keep it uh, relevant uh, geographically. Uh, first off, uh, the bill includes $30 million in investigations funds. Investigations funds are uh, funds that can use to uh, conduct studies uh, for the core. You, you might have uh, been on some of the earlier, or heard the earlier panels talk about the $20 million comprehensive study. Uh, that's part of, of the, uh, the funds that will be available uh, for that long term. There's another 30 million available, uh, half a million of which will be for the project performance evaluation. That's uh, essentially a study of how existing projects, completed projects that were impacted by Sandy, how they performed. And, and uh, that's due actually 120 days from the enactment of the statute. Uh, so that would be in late May, that would be available. The remainder, the $29.5 million that's remaining is for uh, the Corps to expedite and complete ongoing studies. Ongoing meaning before the event. Uh, most of these studies were previously cost shared. The statute does allow these studies to be completed at full federal expense. Okay, so uh, that, of course, uh, that's, that was a big news because in many cases, uh, due to the constraints in the core budget, uh, many of those studies uh, were not being funded anywhere near the level of uh, capability uh, that was needed to, to keep them on schedule. Uh, next appropriation, our construction appropriation is approximately $3.5 billion available. That is to construct uh, uh, projects 
uh, authorized or by non-constructed projects. Uh, when I say projects, I talk about coastal flood risk reduction projects in areas impacted by Sandy, uh, as well as funds to construct projects that are recommended out of the studies that I referenced earlier that will be completed using the, uh, the $29.5 million in investigation funds. Uh, there's also a, a billion dollars in what's called flood control and coastal emergencies funds. These are dollars that are available to repair projects damaged by Sandy to their pre-storm condition. The legislation is unique in that it also allows us to restore those very same projects back to their authorized design profiles. So we, in some cases, we had projects, uh, beach projects, coastal flood risk reduction projects that had not been fully replenished for 10 or 15 years. This, this bill will provide the funds to, to fully restore those projects back to those uh, authorized as built conditions. There's also operation and maintenance funds in the amount of approximately $800 million. These are funds that are, are available to uh, repair projects, federally maintained projects, uh, mostly federal navigation projects in coastal areas that were impacted by Sandy. Uh, this allows us to proceed uh, with the dredging of, of navigation channels, uh, which there was sedimentation uh, as, as a result of Sandy, and to uh, dredge those to their authorized channel depths. Now, as far, far, far as the as far as the project phasing goes, uh, looking at the short term, the focus is on the flood control and coastal emergencies funded projects and the operation and maintenance or O and M projects. Uh, we have actually received funding for these types of projects already uh, at the at the district level. We are in position to move out with construction. In the coming months, we've been working on the contract plans and specifications over the past months uh, since the uh, since the bill was was enacted. And <clears throat> first and foremost, we are looking to get sand back on the beaches in the areas where Sandy caused significant impacts, where sand was lost. We will be repairing those beaches and again restoring those beaches back to their authorized design profiles. That work is scheduled to begin as early as this summer and will continue on for the next year before all the projects are complete. The next phase, and this, this phase will be utilizing part of the $3.5 billion in construction funds will be to move forward with the authorized but unconstructed projects. That means projects that were previously authorized by Congress, but for one reason or the other was never constructed. It could have been due to funding constraints, it could have been due to uh, uh, real estate issues, environmental issues, issues with the, with the non-federal partners. We have funding, and in some cases we have full federal funding to construct those projects depending on if that particular project received federal construction appropriations within the last three fiscal years. These projects are scheduled to begin anywhere from one to three years from today. And then the next phase will be the completion of the ongoing studies, which I mentioned earlier, using the investigation funds, Complete those studies in the next two to three years, at which time the legislation provides authorization to construct the plans recommended by those studies if those plans are deemed to be technically feasible, environmentally acceptable, and economically justified. So this is not only an appropriations bill, it's also an authorizing bill. Those projects then would be funded with part of that $3.5 billion in construction funds, and we anticipate those projects starting anywhere from two to four years from today, depending on the, the amount of study required, where they are, <clears throat> the status of the study, and uh, which in, in many cases, these projects are, are large-scale, multi-year construction projects that could be estimated in several hundred of millions of dollars. 
Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you very much. Um, so Giles, in five minutes, what are you guys doing in national parks? Is that on? So first, I'm not Will Shavroth, listed in the program. Uh, Giles Parker, the Chief of Staff for the National Parks of New York Harbor. And first off, just a uh, little clarifying so you know who we are as well. The National Parks of New York Harbor are the 10 National Park Service sites in New York and northern New Jersey. So that's uh, Gateway National Recreation Area, Castle Clinton, Governor's Island, both of which we just passed behind us, uh, Staten, uh, Statue of Liberty, and uh, Ellis Island. Uh, as you can tell, all of those face many of the issues that we've been hearing about all day as well. Uh, coastal locations, we have 100 miles of coastline all below the uh, FEMA base flood uh, elevation, so we're dealing with those restrictions. Uh, cultural resources in all of those locations, more than 500 historic structures uh, in those locations, including a bathhouse at Breeze Park, the main immigration building on Ellis Island. So some of the strategies we were hearing about earlier about retreating, we can't necessarily retreat from those. Um, and also highly visited uh, urban parks as well. We're looking at uh, 8 million visitors at Gateway uh, per year, uh, 4 million visitors to Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. So, you know, locations that people highly desire for their, their vacations this spring and summer that we, uh, that we need to open up as soon as possible. In the uh, immediate aftermath of Sandy, uh, we had uh, an incident management teams here, about a thousand National Park Service employees uh, transferred in from Alaska to Puerto Rico to handle everything from stabilization and cleanup of our parks to cost estimates that would lead to the Sandy Supplemental as well. That alone was approximately $30 million worth of uh, work in all of our parks, just to, just to make them safe. At the same time as well, uh, utilizing the cooperative management agreement that the, Nash the Secretary of Interior and the Mayor signed last July. Uh, all of our parks were also used for some of the community relief work as well. So that included uh, utilizing uh, Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn, uh, Miller Field in Staten Island, also the parking lot at Reese Beach as locations for all the relief effort as well. Uh, but getting to sort of the big piece of you know, why, why we're here as well is the sub that led to the supplemental as well. For the National Park Service, I can speak to two pieces of it for us. One is a pot for construction, which is uh, $348 million. And the other piece is $360 million for mitigation projects. The 348 is, on the whole, exactly as you said, it's for construction projects, it is to repair the damage that was done within each of the parks. Everything from in infrastructure to additional cleanup to putting it back, what was there. Uh, I think as An Anthony mentioned as well, unique to this one compared to other uh, hurricanes that the National Park Service has had to deal with was that the instruction to build it back better. We don't necessarily need to put back exactly what was there. So for in infrastructure wise, the uh, HVAC and electrical that has been blown out up for the main immigration building on Ellis Island how to actually build that back better. Uh, the breakdown for that, generally speaking, that's still being bundled and approved in Washington, but generally speaking, the, the breakdown is about $180 million of that is for Gateway, that, that it, Gateway National Recreation Area was the most uh, widespread damage for National Park Service sites. Uh, and then approximately $80 million for the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. Uh, on top of that for construction, we're also working with DOT on some smaller projects uh, as well, like the docks at uh, Statue of Liberty uh, and also some trail work uh, for Gateway. The $360 million in mitigation funding, that's a little, uh, that's across all of DOI. The National Park Service was one of the many agencies that were able to submit projects in for that funding. That those ranged in possibilities from inventory and monitoring to dune replenishment to additional work with, with Army Corps and, and others. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're right at the deadline for when the approval will happen for that for OMB. So I can't actually speak to the exact projects that have been approved for any of the, those agencies, but that should be coming out sometime this week. Uh, the phase one work on the construction proceeds as we speak. So that actually is focused on getting our beaches and ballparks uh, set to go for this uh, Memorial Day. 
Uh, that includes uh, Reese Beach opening up and also uh, out of Miller Field and Great Kills on Staten Island, Sandy Hook in, in New Jersey. Uh, it's also focused on getting Statue of Liberty uh, reopened by uh, July 4th as well. So, again, a little bit more, but uh, on the whole, that's, that covers the gist of it. Yeah, thanks. I thought. Newark Waterfront or Liberty State Park or some of the Jamaica Bay uh, wetland uh, restoration projects. These are projects that we, as members of the civic community, like. They are authorized core projects. Are we able to go in, are we going to be able to get any funding for those projects? That is in doubt. Why is it in doubt? Because they are not authorized as flood risk reduction projects. OMB has no problem with these projects because the money has already been appropriated. So it's up to the Corps of Engineers uh, and its uh, leadership. Uh, but it's going to be a real struggle. And when you look at the strength of those civic organizations, um, and if we can't make this happen, I don't know who can. Uh, but that is an ongoing uh, struggle and will continue for the next uh, uh, few weeks. Um, and then if you look at some of the other core projects, uh, remember this money is supposed to promote resiliency and sustainability, but Anthony has just told us the first billion is going to repair the beaches the way they were. Is that resiliency? Is that sustainability? Um, and then billions more will go for other authorized projects, most of which are moving sand. These were projects authorized by Congress in some cases decades ago. The big question is, where's that sand going to go? Is it going to go where the Corps thought it should go in the 1990s or 1980s and 1970s on the beachfront? Or if face of sea level rise, um, sort of sand and you know water moving uh, further inland, is that going to shift? Is it going to shift inland? Where's that sand going to go? Well, the further inland you go, you're going to start running into private property. So what happens? Well, buyouts, can that be done systematically? I'm just trying to make the point there can be a lot of brave talk about resiliency and sustainability. The real question is in the nitty gritty um, when this kind of protection, um, and the core fortunately is no longer talking about hard structures in most cases, but uh, right now the using sand, uh, 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 is that money that's being used to move sand to build new berms, is that truly going to promote sustainability and resiliency? It's going to be a constant fight, uh, you know, to make that happen. One could ask the same questions when it comes to the nitty-gritty. I think about community development block grants, uh, uh, money about which I know, uh, you know, far less. Uh, I do think about some of the, uh, under the state's uh, Brownsfield Act of 2003, uh, there, there are areas in New York City called Brownsfield Opportunity Area Programs. These are low-income communities with concentrations of Brownsfield. Uh, many of them are on the waterfront. Many of them were damaged by uh, Katrina, uh, by uh, Sandy. Uh, under the statute, uh, there's supposed to be special focus on sort of uh, more vulnerable, lower-income communities. So I think we really have to see whether those communities are going to be beneficiaries of some of this money. So I think that the uh, civic organizations uh, have got a big and important role here to play uh, as everything moves forward. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Jamie, Giles, Anthony, you know, what, are, what are the best ways for civic groups to weigh in and help you guys and be influential in your thinking about how money gets spent? Uh, uh, so, uh, speaking for the task force specifically, part of our role uh, is to be with you know the civic leadership, the kind of groups that, that Jim is talking about, and, and, and you know, for example, I see Eddie Batista in the audience, I spent time with Eddie, and, and folks that he works with, and others in the audience. So, um, you know. Um, so we're, we're doing a certain amount of outreach. I mean, I, I give you, I, I, to be totally honest, I don't come from the federal government, so I can say this. Um, this is not, in my observation, something that the federal government necessarily does particularly well. It's kind of outgoing community engagement, um, you know, really broad, deep community engagement, but, you know, it's, we're trying. Um, and it's one of the things that Sean is very much committed to, and so we're trying to do it. Um, you know, uh, how to, and unfortunately, we don't run a, we're not running a formal process of the task force, so it isn't sort of a public comment process where there's a rules and you have X amount of time and an official way to submit comments. Really, to be totally honest, it's just a matter of 
getting hold of us, but if you can find us, and everybody's in the room now, I'm more than happy to be with everybody. Um, as far as HUD goes, it's much more, uh, more, more or less everybody, um, and once. Um, as far as HUD goes, it's much more uh, kind of straightforward. So HUD is the Community Development Block Grant um, process is pretty well set forward, and there are experts everywhere who know how to do it. The state and the city put out their plans for common, which they've done. Um, there's a minimum seven-day public comment period, and probably a lot of folks in the room have put in their comments. And um, the recipients of the money are obligated to take those comments into account, and they supply HUD with a summary of those comments and the ways in which they address them. Now, there is an issue, obviously, of what happens if the comments that groups like yours uh, supply aren't reflected in the ultimate plans and distribution of the money, and the answer is, um, you know, that happens, obviously. Um, and there are processes also in place for you to, um, to uh, make it clear to the government that that's what you think has happened. So, but it's a much more kind of straightforward, well-trodden path. Um, and I'll, get, I'll let Anthony talk about the core. Okay. Other than the $20 million comprehensive study, all of the studies and projects that will be funded at the Sandy Supplemental are ongoing efforts that are being conducted in partnership with our non-federal sponsors. And it's our non-federal partners who are the conduit to the local government and the local uh, local communities. Uh, the Corps has a very collaborative process uh, in, our, in our study phase. Uh, we cannot proceed uh, without the support of our, our partners, our non-federal partners, who in turn answer to, to those local communities, which include the, the civic groups. So the process does not change. Uh, yes, the, the, the funding is there. The authorization from Congress may be there, but the core process is the same as it's, as it's been. And, and the core, I think, we do have a very open communication with, with our partners because, again, we cannot proceed without their support. I'm sorry, I just want to, I'm sorry, I just want, I'm going to jump on for one second. Uh, I would say a couple things. I've been doing this for about six months pretty intensively, or whatever it is, since Sandy. Um, and I, I really think, you know, particularly with the core, the, the agencies that I'm working most closely with, the core, besides I, the core, FEMA, and a few others, um, the, um, the, the commitment to public engagement and being responsive to public, the local stakeholders really has been extraordinary, I think. Um, what I would say is my sense is that this is a moment, not that that's not always the case, but just because of the resources that are focused intensively in the region right now, this is a moment when that's, with this real, and there's so much just general awareness of what's going on. This is a, um, this is a particularly good moment for community engagement of this kind. If I were you all, I would be worried about something I think somebody else referenced before, and and, um, and I've heard about in some of the other panels, which is what happens when the task force sunsets. What happens when a lot of the FEMA folks leave the region? You know, there were 20,000 I think in here at one point. There's going to be. Or, that's not right, but anyway, there's going to be, you know, a much lower number. What happens when all the sort of the the, you know, the, the the federal forces recede, and it's back to more or less normal, and you've got, you know, sort of a quote, peacetime group, and there isn't the resource available for for active engagement in that way. So I think one of the things that we most need advice on is what do we do about successor bodies that can continue to keep up, to, that can continue the line of, uh, you know, continue to be engaged with this group. And, and I don't, I don't know what the answer. Is. Totally on what they both just said. Uh, I, I think based on the experiences for the Park Service in, uh, at Katrina, wildland fires out west, there, there's obviously a process in place for us to deal with uh, public comment and, and the NEPA process for having input from our partners and the public on all of our projects. Maybe building off of what uh, David said, though, there's obviously a need to, to integrate that, though, as well. I mean, building off of the strengths of other organizations as well. We've already had to do that quite a bit. Uh, our, our partners with, with New York City Parks uh, have a strength in this to know the communities, know where the community boards are, how to get into those, and, and talk to the uh, local constituencies about what's, what's planned or what, what's happened within our parks. Uh, so we've built off of that and also worked with uh, with Dan Zarelli and, and the SIRR folks as well to, to get to those meetings and listen in to, to what's planned there and integrate with that, that plan. Uh, but also uh, unusual to this uh, incident for, for the National Park Services, it, it happened at a time when Gateway, as I mentioned, the park that was impacted the most, is in the process of a general management plan, which is a uh, 15 to 20 year strategic planning document for the park. That's a part of the NEPA process that has to be integrated with our partners, with the public comments as well. 
Uh, that is still going forward and will be released for its final version in June as well. So I would, that's the part that I would uh, put out here is for public comments on that. All the impacts from Sandy have been integrated into the document. And so it maybe gets to what um, James was saying that as well is we're looking at what we need to do over the next two to three years, but how does what we're doing in that two to three years work for the 15 to 20 year time frame? Uh, if, if I could just sort of add one thing. Um, from our point of view, speaking for the New York, New Jersey Harbor Coalition, the New York district has been terrific. Um, they've been supportive of our effort. The resistance is coming higher up. So, Jamie, we're looking to the HUD task force to help us solve our problem. <laughs> All right. I'm right through October, I'm with you. After that. <laughs> um, a couple of people have asked, what's the, what's the state of collaboration? What is the state of collaboration between New York and New Jersey? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Can we add Connecticut? I don't know. I don't. I. I uh, you can add Connecticut if you want. Um, <laughs> so I mean, we're the task force. I guess I'm. I'm I can help answer the task force. Is, there is a me in New Jersey. Um, he's slightly taller. Uh, and he's got an office that looks like mine. He's got 10 or so people uh, doing kind of what I'm doing in New Jersey. Um, so the task force, within the task force and within the federal government, as far as I can tell, there is, in the task force, there's certainly a lot of collaboration on across regional issues. Within federal agencies, I think it really depends on the agency. Frankly, I think there's a fair amount of siloization, um, just because that's the way it's set up, and a lot of what's being dealt with right now is local. Um, if you're asking about the states cooperating with each other, um, you know, I think that's, uh, I would say, yet to come. There was great cooperation around getting the supplemental passed because that's, you know, where the rubber meets the road. But, um, but in terms of looking, for example, for, you know, big regional projects around New York Harbor or something like that to collaborate on, you know, unless it's set in place by, the, you know, for example, the government structure of the Port Authority, I wouldn't say I've seen a lot of it myself. Charles, any comment? I mean, I could add the fact that the National Park Service's uh, recovery effort stretches from Fire Island down through to Florida, and so we're, we're working across state for our individual sites. But I'll admit that I do not believe most of our projects looked across, even across parks in, in many cases, though. Okay. There are a bunch of good questions that, that came in about constraints. Uh, what, what do you guys see as constraints on these dollars, besides the fact that there's probably not enough? But um, what can't they be used for that people are going to want to have money for going forward? Okay, as far as the, the core program goes, um, I, I think the, the greatest constraint we see is uh, the non-federal cost share for those projects where, where the cost share will, will apply. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are some cases uh, based on our interpretation of the legislation uh, where the projects may be implemented at 100% federal cost, but um, that's only a handful. Most of these projects, as the, the projects that will become construction projects after the studies are complete, they will require, for the most part, a 35% non-federal cost share, and even though the legislation allows for payback of that non-federal cash contribution over 30 years, that's still, still going to be a challenge for our non-federal partners uh, in, in the state of New York and New Jersey because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of these projects are in the range of hundreds of millions of dollars. And not only the upfront cost share is an issue, but uh, some of these projects require not only the day-to-day -day maintenance, but actual operation. If there's a hard structure included, such as a pump station or a tie gate, uh, the operation costs are the responsibility of the non-federal cost sharing partner, in essence for perpetuity, because once the project's completed, it's turned over to the sponsor for operation and maintenance and ownership, and unless that project is specifically deauthorized by Congress, which rarely happens, it's basically the sponsor who, who is responsible. Jim, do you want to take a run at that? Um, yeah, I mean, actually, I think the flexibility has been is pretty extraordinary. We I did sort of a back of the envelope calculation. If you take, um, uh, if you just think about flexibility f 
from the perspective, for example, of mitigation. So how much of this money is available for other than you know repair and reimbursement, but for real what we do as what you all probably think of as mitigation. So improvement of you know not not just building it back the way it was, but real improvement or changing it to the so that it's more resilient and, and um, uh, you know uh, either more appropriate to the new situation or whatever. Um, the numbers that I came up with were sort of between, I think it was at least $15 billion, something like that, and that includes a big chunk of the DOT funding that's specifically for mitigation, a big chunk of FEMA funding that is specifically for mitigation. There's a hazard mitigation grant program that the state, basically the states will have um, total control over, uh, which is a percent tax as a percentage of the overall cost of the disaster. So in the case of New York State, for example, it's going to be probably close to a billion dollars. And again, highly flexible money. So I'm actually, I mean, there are plenty of things that you can't use it for. There are prohibitions of the community development block grant money, for example, largely against using it for, um, we largely can't provide funds to big businesses, uh, which is a disappointment, for example, for Con Ed, who have all kinds of good projects, mitigation projects, resilience projects, and they want um, that are instead going to have to be funded by rate case, rate, rate payers. But I mean, for the most part, the constraints are, are you know, um, Sort of some technical stuff, but mostly just you know if there's not enough money, ultimately in size. Charles, do you want to take a look? Yeah. Well, I, I would add sequestration to the top of the list of it. Uh, that was a little bit of a cut, uh, but also for the, our construction funds, w uh, one difficulty we've had is tied to location as well. Uh, if the best, uh, we've had, we do have a lot of flexibility, as, as Jamie was mentioning, but uh, if, if a project is best to, suited to have dredging, uh, I heard a proposal earlier today as well, dredging at, at the uh, mouth of Jamaica Bay is the solution to some of the issues, say, at our Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. Our dollars for, for fixing Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge are, are tied to that location. We can't necessarily utilize those in another location to fix the problem somewhere else. That is, again, getting back to the flexibility piece of it though, is that's where we see that, that our $360 million is then available to apply for projects there to, to pick up the slack as well. So I, I agree, there's a lot of flexibility to work around it. Mr. Northrup, I want to make sure that my question gets addressed. Uh, I'm Alice Labrie, I'm former U.S. Department of State Foreign Service, and I worked under Ambassador uh, Holbrook, who taught us to be forceful about our questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> My question, you are has, That's good. Go for it. my question has to do with the Harlem River where I reside on 146, which is constantly forgotten. And my question is written there. My Assemblyman Farrell is trying to get the federal government to help pay for the repair of our bulkhead, which fell in the Harlem River and almost took six cars with it. We had extensive flooding from the number three train terminus, which we built over That's the air right. So, Mr. Yes, Rubin, one, two, Mr. Yeah. Fiora, what's going to happen with my heart? Uh, hello, this is uh, Roland Lewis. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Where is it? Anybody having a good time? Is he taking over Anybody our like the NWA oh, conference? Oh, <laughs> Anybody learn something? Have you met your three people? Jamie, you want to You get four extra credit. Uh, here's the... the, the, the the fight, we're, we're, we're on break right now, <laughs> and we're in the final lap. We're heading towards the cocktail party. Does anyone here like cocktails? <laughs> All right. No, but not before we all I know. That's why I joined So uh, he's enforcing time limits. I guess that's the point here. Um, so listen, um, I can we get a private conversation with you uh, no, right quick, after this? Because we are public. out of time, and Just they are going to cut our microphone. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to do a quick thing? The one thing I can tell you is I think, I think uh, Anthony's exactly right. Uh, you don't have the right people up here. Is one short answer, which is it's really a FEMA issue. Yes or no? But I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about it separately. No, yes or no? Is Harlem River getting some of your money? That's all I want to know. Harlem River getting some of our money. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there is no authorized ongoing study or project for the Harlem River. However, um, we are doing a comprehensive study that's looking at uh, coastal populations at risk and I'm uh, sure the Harlem River and similar areas will be part of that comprehensive effort. Thank you. So um, I, I want to say thank you to the panel. Uh, thank you all for your good questions. I'm sorry we didn't get them all. I guess the last, the last thought that, uh, that uh, crosses my mind about this stuff is that I know we're all going to work really hard to make sure that the resources we have available get spent well, and that's going to be a very important and difficult task. 
but there are going to be other needs and you know almost immediately we're going to have to turn our sights to so what do we do to fill those other needs you know and there are going to be other storms too so we're not sure whether we're going to get another sandy supplemental at this scale i mean maybe next time the congress won't even allow that to happen so we've got some very significant long-term challenges about how to raise resources for the needs of Sandy and then the needs of kind of future events that are going to come our way in the future. And it's going to take a lot of effort to make sure that stuff gets handled well. You know, the New York, New Jersey Coalition is going to play a role on Sandy for us, for this region. You know, our state and our city are incredibly well organized on this stuff. We're going to do okay. But that longer term agenda is going to be very, very daunting. So, anyway, but thanks all to cocktails. Woohoo! All right, I would love to